This is Intelligence Matter, sponsored by General Atomics Aeronautical Systems, the world leader in unmanned aircraft systems and makers of the affordable, scalable, and autonomous new collaborative combat aircraft. Chen Han Wang covers Chinese politics and foreign policy for The Wall Street Journal. As a China-focused reporter for their journal since 2014, he has written widely on subjects spanning elite politics, Communist Party doctrine, human and labor rights, as well as defense and diplomatic affairs. Chen Han was part of a team of journal reporters named as Pulitzer Prize finalists in 2021 for their coverage of China's autocratic turn under Xi Jinping. He's also written a terrific book on Xi's leadership, Party of One, The Rise of Xi Jinping and China's Superpower Future. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Wall Street Journal reporter Chen Han Wang to talk about Xi Jinping's China. America must not fall behind in air dominance. That's why we need the Collaborative Combat Aircraft by General Atomics Aeronautical Systems. These new unmanned combat jets are affordable, scalable, and autonomous, and they partner with traditional combat formations to let American and allied pilots see first and act first. Our next generation jets will let Washington retake the numbers advantage in the skies. For Collaborative Combat Aircraft, rely on General Atomics Aeronautical, the world leader in unmanned aircraft systems. Learn more at UAV.com. Chan Han, welcome to the podcast. Well, why don't we start with you telling us a little about yourself and, and your work as a Wall Street Journal reporter in China. What's that like? Sure. Thanks, Andy. Uh, great to come on the show. Um, yeah. So basically, perhaps to do a bit of a uh, personal biography. I joined Dow Jones, the company in 2010, first in Singapore with the Newswire site. And then I started writing for the Wall Street Journal uh, after they merged the two newsrooms, the Newswire with the Journal Newsrooms around 2011, 2010, I'm sorry, 2012. Uh, and then I was given an opportunity to go to China uh, in 2014. I moved to Beijing. And then from there, I spent five years uh, covering all sorts of things, you know, general news, um, breaking news events, for example, you know, natural disasters or some industrial accidents, uh, even a cruise ship capsizing in which more than 400 people died, you know, traveling around the country, getting a chance to see the real China, so to speak. Uh, I was also asked to cover uh, politics and I, you know, started to do more and more of that as my colleague who used to cover that subject moved on to other things. And that's when I really started to come to terms with, you know, trying to understand how the party functions, how is Xi Jinping trying to govern China, how is, what sort of political changes and economic changes, societal changes that he's pushing through. Um, and after that, in 2019, I was forced to leave mainland China after I wrote a story about Xi Jinping's cousin. Uh, me and my colleague, we co-wrote a story about how that cousin was uh, being looked into by Australian authorities for his associations with people who thought to have uh, organized crime and money laundering links. Um, and that story, uh, we believe, prompted the Chinese government to not renew my uh, journalist visa, and I had to leave uh, mainland China thereafter, uh, moved to Hong Kong, where I continued to cover Chinese politics from there, and then moved back to Singapore last year, where I still continue to cover China uh, elite politics and foreign policy. Chen you know, I mentioned the, that your book in the introduction, uh, Party of One. So before we talk about the one, which is Xi Jinping, can you give a high level, give a high level discussion about how the party functions in China today? I know it's intricate and complicated, but maybe yeah. you can boil that down a little bit for our listeners. Sure. Um, the sort of Cliff Notes version of it is basically the Communist Party essentially is the most dominant political force in China. Uh, in Xi Jinping's own words, the party leads everything. Um, that spanning everything from you know politics, economy, uh, society, legal affairs, education, military, just about every facet of public life, every facet of how the society is not supposed to function. The party must be in charge. The party must have a say, uh, even if the party is not entirely interested in getting into the nitty gritty of a particular issue. They must have the you know veto power. They must have the final say in deciding how things should be done. So that's the level of dominance you're talking about. Party members, all the way from the very top leader Xi Jinping, down to the grassroots, down to the villages, you know, down to the most remote corners of China, 
uh, there are party members. The party just announced a couple of days ago that its membership has reached more than 99 million members, which if you think about it, is bigger than quite a few countries in the world, you know. So that's the scale you're talking about in terms of how far uh, the party permeates through Chinese society. So let's let's talk a, uh, about Xi Jinping. Can, can you give us a, a, a little bit of background? You know, how did he begin his rise through the the levels of the Communist Party? Sure. Um, so Xi Jinping, I think the one thing to know about him to start with is that the, he's, a, he's the son of a revolutionary hero. You know, his father, Xi Zhongxin, uh, you know, fought in the revolution since the 1930s. Um, so basically, when you, you're, you're sort of this, uh, in, in Chinese parlance, they would call Xi Jinping a princeling. He's someone who is descended from a senior official, someone of revolutionary stock. Uh, when Xi Jinping was born in 1953, uh, Xi Zhongxin was a propaganda minister under Mao Zedong. So he's really, at that time, even though China was still poor, uh, he grew up in relative luxury. Um, obviously, everything, you know, you have to compare it to the rest of society. Well, for him, uh, he was, you know, born in Beijing. He had access to good schooling, access to good living conditions. Um, so that was so, sort of his beginning. You know, he began from Persian privilege. Then he went through the Cultural Revolution. His father was Persian in 1962. And then when the Cultural Revolution started in 1966, that was this actual burden on him, being the son of a disgraced official. Went through a lot of turmoil in his life. And at some point when he was going through this tumultuous period, he decided that he wanted to join the party. And in his own words, he said something like, you know, if there are more good people in the party, uh, then there will be fewer bad people. Um, there were other people in his life at the time, his friends would say things like, um, in, in, in further down the line, when people asked him about it, one of his friends told an American diplomat that Xi Jinping essentially chose to survive by becoming redder than red. You know, he wanted to uh, test himself, commit himself. And, you know, he sort of bought into the idea, even though the party at that point in his life had given him nothing but, you know, disruptions and pretty severe ones. Um, that sort of, I think, you could we could say to be the genesis of his political career. Uh, he had joined the party in 1974 uh, and then basically became a village secretary, you know, the village where he was sent down to in rural province of Shanxi at the time. Uh, he threw himself at the job. He really, you know, uh, bled the way in terms of trying to improve living conditions of the village. Uh, he threw himself at the sort of the manual labor that was required of living in a place like that. Um, and then he went on, when he went to university, he was telling friends that he had no interest in uh, doing uh, technical work in the chemistry industry, which is the, the degree that he was pursuing. He actually wanted to go into politics. So even as early as then, you know, 1975, when he enrolled at Tsinghua University in Beijing, in the late 70s, he was already thinking, you know, what's next, you know? Uh, and that seemed at that time already that he wanted to go into politics. So from that point, you know, at first after graduation, he joined the PLA uh, thanks to his father's connections. Um, his father called on an old buddy of his, uh, Gong Biao, who at the time was a senior member of the establishment who was uh, in charge of military affairs. He was in the Central Military Commission uh, and that later would soon become defense minister and Xi Jinping Essentially, actually, he was a uniform member of the PLA. He, was, but he served as a secretary to Gong Biao, and he did that for three years. And he could have stayed on. He could have decided that you know I can make myself a, a career in the military. And in fact, Gong Biao sort of suggested he should do so. But he decided that I want to do bigger things. In fact, that's what he told some of his friends. You know, I, that he believed that he should go down to the provinces work up from the bottom up, you know, get the experience he needed because he believed working for the provinces is sort of this um, pathway to power. From there, he can actually make it into the central government. And that's what he did. So can I interrupt for sure. a second? So this all sounds mm -hmm. like you would get a, a good leader out of this, right? He, yeah. He served in the military. He's working with the provinces, trying to understand what the people need and want. And so th all this sounds reasonable. Uh, but what we what, but what we have today seems far less reasonable, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think it's interesting because th that that the the cross off career path that I describe obviously is you know post fact you know where the Chinese propaganda machinery would point to his career and tell you this is exactly the training we want from our leaders you know someone who 
went through politics from the bottom up. He knows what it's like for the low, local officials, you know, to do their daily jobs and then work through every level of government before he qualified to run the country. So, in fact, it is a point of uh, uh, sort of that the Chinese uh, uh, officials would use to sort of justify the choice of Xi Jinping as China's leader. Obviously, you know, um, many other officials in the system go through a similar rise, uh, maybe not to the extent and maybe without some of the, the advantages that Xi Jinping had. But, um, you know, it's debatable whether, to the extent, whether you, you could say this training is directly, uh, you know, to the extent that it prepares him to govern China of today, um, which is a far more different, far more complex, far more dynamic society, economy. Um, but and from that perspective, from the Chinese government's perspective, it is good training. I think he, from his own perspective, he believes it's good training. Um, one thing that he does talk about a lot after becoming leader is this idea that uh, local frontline local officials, county level officials, are among the, the bedrock of the party, like the, the bedrock of good governance. You know, if you are a county official, you are essentially the face of the party to the vast majority of the nation. So, and you have to deal with just about everything. Um, you know, you might think somewhere at the, at the top leadership level has to deal with everything. You know, from politics to economy to society uh, to you know, also the integrity, the, 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 the hot nuts and bolts of making sure the country functions well. At the county level, a county level official is responsible for all those things at that level of, of governance, where, whereas people in between the county and the, the, the national level might not have to do that sort of broad ranging level of responsibility. So actually county level training is very important and he talks a lot about it. So at the, when he's at the national level, was he handpicked by Hu Xintao? Or well, so did, that's the, there's, there's no, um, the, obviously this is a lot of it's based on, you know, um, hearsay and sort of wisdoms that's passed through, filtered out from inside the party through, you know, news reports and uh, informed, um, you know, sort of discussions among, you know, uh, sort of princelings and other people in the, in the system talking to people outside. So there's no like clear... Um, record of who made what decisions that ultimately put Xi Jinping in the position to take take power. There, there is an official account of how he was became heir apparent. It involved um, internal democracy. You know, the party lead had to vote for <laughs> who they believed was qualified for the job. But obviously, it's a bit more complicated than that. But um, a lot of people, um, if you talk to people who are in the know and who have, you know, within the system or at least know people in the system, they will tell you that uh, essentially, Fu Jintao didn't get to choose Xi Jinping. Uh, Xi Jinping's uh, essential anointment as crown prince, back you trace it back to 2007 when he joined the standing committee, the Politburo standing committee, the highest decision making body of the Communist Party, as the sixth rank member, essentially one ahead of Li Keqiang, who was the only other person of the similar age group, uh, of a similar age tier as Xi Jinping, because everyone else was older than them. So essentially, it was clear that these two people are coming up next. They're going to be the next leaders of China. And the fact that Xi Jinping came out one step ahead of Li Keqiang meant that he was number one and Li Keqiang would be number two. So the, at that time, 2007, Jiang Zemin was still very influential. Uh, even though by that point, he had retired from all his official positions, uh, he actually held on to his military position, you know, the chairman of Central Military Commission for two more years um, after he had stepped down when the, the party position for two more years and the state position to 2005. So actually, yeah, and retained significant influence over internal party politics, internal party affairs. And the, the consensus is that Jiang Zemin was essentially the one who made sure Xi Jinping actually got the job. So what's different here? Uh, it, the, the book is Party of One, which suggests an inordinate amount of power with one person. I think many of us believe that's always been the case in, in China. Is that, so what's, What's different today than for Hu Jintao or Hu Jintao's predecessors? So I think it's quite clear that over the past decade or so, since Xi Jinping took power in late 2012, there's been a very consistent effort to centralize decision-making uh, authority with the top leadership. And then within the top leadership, you centralize decision-making power within one person. Um, then that, that one person, obviously, is Xi Jinping. 
Um, this you, I saw you have to contrast this with what the situation was like uh, before she took office. So back then, you know, there was this saying uh, people would use to describe this sort of state of uh, elite governance. Uh, at the national level was the nine dragons controlling the waters. At the time, the standing committee had nine members. And this saying essentially conveyed the idea that there were nine very powerful men in this committee, and they each sort of had their own areas of responsibility, each had their own vested interests to defend, each had their own, you know, uh, protégés to look out for, and they were all sort of jostling with each other. And things were not getting done because power is too diffuse. Hu Jintao was essentially uh, premise into Paris, right? He was first among equals. Uh, there was no sense that he could exert uh, overwhelming power or overrule other people. He had to govern through consensus and the difficulties of finding that consensus within such a large group of uh, men, each representing very vastly different sets of interests, uh, meant that a lot of important decisions were not made. They were they were kicked. The can was kicked down the road, uh, particularly in terms of economic and social reforms. And that was the sort of context that I think Xi Jinping was reacting to. His choice as leader was, in as much as his you know personal qualities, but also this idea that we needed someone to come in who can do a job for the party to shake up the party to sort of deal with this bureaucratic stasis that had. Uh, meant that a lot of policymaking had become uh, ossified and he needed to come in and change things up. So whereas after Xi Jinping came in, you know, he accumulated power through anti-corruption purges, through variety of political tools at his disposal. And what he really wants to do, I think, is to, first of all, reinstate the party's dominance over everything. It's, it's all relative, right? So it's not that the party wasn't dominant. It's just that he believes that during the past 30, 40 years or so since the Mao era, there was this sort of delegation of technocratic policymaking powers to the state, to government agencies, to the quote-unquote experts. And he felt that uh, in this process, there was this, people were losing sight of what matters, which is in their context, what matters is keeping the Communist Party in power, keeping the Communist Party in charge of everything, because they ultimately were the rulers of the country. And by reinstating the party's dominance, that meant that instead of delegating technocratic policymaking to state organizations, to state organs, to government ministries, he was going to take that back within the party's uh, ambit, within the party's remit. The party had for a long part of time, you know, they sort of delegated that stuff away. They just took charge of higher, higher level ideological issues and personnel appointments. But now the party was getting involved in the nitty gritty. Um, and within that, that actually meant that Xi Jinping had much greater influence over decision-making down the chain because he had no government position apart from being state president. That is, you know, essentially a ceremonial position. For him to actually be able to influence nuts and bolts of governance, he had to do so through the party machinery. So actually centralizing, subsuming state powers back under the party, subsuming those sort of policy-making powers under the party was one way for him to bring that more directly under his control. And within the party, he centralized decision-making, reporting channels all end up with him. He became the chairman of many committees that, you know, were in charge of decision-making. That basically funneled a lot of, you know, policy-making and decision-making authority and onto his own person. So forgive this simplification, but you're describing Emperor Xi, not yeah. necessarily President Xi. Is that the way you think about it? I don't necessarily think about it that way, but I can see why people will make that comparison. Um, in fact, um, before Xi Jinping took power, there's a Japanese journalist who published a book that sort of, uh, as we now know, uh, his prediction was wrong, but he actually saw, sort of uh, guessed that Xi Jinping might turn out to be China's, uh, communist China's weakest emperor. Um, because, you know, he, yeah, it's, I guess it's an easy comparison to make, it's an easy analogy to draw, but... Uh, at the time, actually, his prediction was that she would not be very powerful. As you now know, that yeah. turned out to be wrong. But I think, you know, it is, it is, it is an analogy a lot of people understand. Uh, Chinese people, especially, having, you know, a lot of them are very au fait with imperial history. You know, they enjoy watching period dramas. They write, write, uh, enjoy reading about their own imperial past. And, you know, in fact, people within the elite circles, they will tell you that, you know, one, one reason why Xi Jinping seems to be so intent on remaking the system in his own image and sort of 
do what he would call as institutionalized, institutionalizing Communist Party rule to entrench Communist Party power in China for the long term is because he doesn't want to be the last emperor of Red China. Um, you know, there, there's this sort of pathological fear that, you know, if you're in charge now and if things end under your watch, then you will be, you know, a uh, sort of sinner of history. So I think that's one fate that he wants to avoid. So now that we're talking about sort of internal dynamics in China, clearly they're facing a variety of internal headwinds, uh, economic headwinds, financial things of that nature. Do you think that she is prepared to deal with those? Does he have the the right mindset to deal with those, or could those be his undoing? I so thought this this requires sort of um, value judgment from an outsider, which I think is very difficult uh, to answer. But I think one way you could look at it is how they look at this issue, and I think um, they definitely think they've got the wherewithal. They definitely think they have the tools, and they have the right talent. They have the right um, system. In fact, the political system to deal with these issues. Um, Chinese officials and the propaganda machinery are very fond of pointing out flaws in Western democracies. Um, you know, every sort of public misstep by, for example, the American president is jumped upon and sort of served up as an idea like, look, you know, Western democracy isn't all it's cracked up to be. There are problems with it. They are dysfunctional. Uh, whereas in China, our authoritarian system gets things done. We've delivered the economic miracle over the past few decades. We are now ready to take the next step. Obviously, you know, the situation now is a bit more difficult. It's rather challenging in terms of economic front, severe uh, problems that they haven't resolved for the past few decades that they now have to come to grips with. Uh, in terms of demographic slowdown, uh, economic slowdown, um, structural problems with how the uh, economy is functioning that they need to address in order to even, you know, progress to the next stage of development, break out the middle income trap. Uh, but they would argue that being in a system like this, um, they're in a better position because they can take make decisions and follow through. They can implement them. They're in a far better position to uh, push through decisions, reach certain decisions, and then enact them. That would be their argument. Um, and I, as you look at sort of the way they talk about the issues at hand, um, obviously this is for public consumption, so they have to project confidence, but you, at the same time, the way they're going about things, they acknowledge the depth of the challenge, but they also don't seem to be too concerned that you know they eventually can come around to dealing with it. We talk to officials and uh, Chinese economists privately, they do express a certain level of confidence uh, even if they recognize that the current situation is fairly uh, challenging. I think fundamentally when they look at themselves and they look at other possibilities outside of China, um, they come to the conclusion that, you know, we're not doing too bad. You know, we, we, could, we could be worse from their perspective. And the tools that they have at disposal, it may, it, it may require some tough decision making, it may require some pain. Uh, that they need to go through, but I think they believe they're in a position to go through that process, endure that pain, and come out through the other side in a better shape. So does this feed into, in your mind, does this feed into this super assertive foreign policy that, we're, that we've seen from Xi Jinping and, and, and the PRC? And, and um, how, how does this fit together? So I think there is a connection in the sense that they do see themselves as... Um, a great power and in the sense that they have a, you know, they might even argue it's a superior system to Western liberal democracy. Uh, but fundamentally, I think, you know, as Chinese diplomats like to say, diplomacy is extension of internal affairs. So one key driver, I think, for this transition to a more forward-leaning form of foreign policy comes from Xi's core platform, um, which is the China dream, you know, the China dream of national rejuvenation or you know, to draw a comparison with a more familiar American slogan, make China great again, <laughs> uh, essentially. Basically, under Xi Jinping, China must become a nation that is respected globally. It will not play second fiddle to anyone. It will not behave deferentially to other big powers. Uh, and, and Xi Jinping, in his old words, would talk about this in terms of 
being able to look the world in the eye, you know, basically we're on the level, we are essentially equals with anyone out there. And this sort of core impulse, I think, drives this desire to sort of command this respect, earn this respect, and sort of intrude their assertive behavior, project this sense of being a big power. You know, it's, it's not good enough just to have that uh, economic clout and military potential. You need to sort of flex it for it to convince anyone, everyone else, and especially yourself, that you are there. And I think uh, that this this sort of what we some people are calling the wolf warrior diplomacy, you know, this very aggressive, abrasive style of engaging the outside world. I think that is one well way to express that. Uh, it is a way to uh, assuage domestic expectations when you build your political platform on the very core idea of making China a great respected power. People at home must see how this plays out. People must must see that diplomats, you know carry themselves in that way. And, you know, when, for example, when the U.S. does something that is deemed offensive to China, like selling arms to Taiwan or criticizing China's human rights record, they expect their representatives on the global stage to push back very vigorously in order to show that, you know, we will not take being, you know, second guessed by the countries. We will not take being bullied or, you know, questioned. You know, we are as good as anyone else out there, if not better. So why should we treat why should we be treated like that? I think that's one of the key impulses that drive this uh, transition. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Wall Street Journal reporter Chan Han Wong. Beacon Global Strategies is the premier national security advisory firm. Beacon works side by side with leading companies to help them understand national security policy, geopolitical risk, global technology policy, and federal procurement trends. Beacon's insight gives business leaders the decision advantage. Founded in 2013, Beacon develops and supports the execution of bespoke strategies to mitigate business risk, drive growth, and navigate a complex geopolitical environment. With a bipartisan team and decades of experience, Beacon provides a global perspective to help clients tackle their toughest challenges. Do you think this is this assertive foreign policy would continue even if there are strong economic headwinds and they begin so the you know my view here in the past has always been the party's biggest worry is control mm-hmm. control of the of the people control of the country um and sometimes there's a trade-off between the economy and you know the foreign policy demands is, you think china can take both tracks or you know given, you know, whatever happens economically may may make them turn in some way. So we've already seen a little bit of adjustment, uh, which you could attribute to the domestic economic conditions. Um, I mean, the Chinese economic slowdown has been going on for a while. It's a secular trend, but I think there were a lot of uh, uh, contingent factors that sort of made it worse, uh, COVID being one of them. Um, Sour relationships with, you know, other trading partners, major trading partners like the US and Europe uh, is another factor. And I think that the second element is what sort of informed this adjustment. I wouldn't call it a shift uh, in a significant way in the sense that they're not, they, they're not changing how they see the world. Uh, as a result of this, more like they, they're adjusting how they deal with the outside world in this period of domestic uh, economic difficulty. So we saw China sort of try to repair relationship with the US. Xi Jinping went to San Francisco last year, uh, to met with President Biden, and sort of attempted to stabilize the relationship, right? Even if you don't expect the relationship to improve significantly, you are trying to draw a line and trying to set a floor and uh, uh, what had been a relationship that was sort of threatening to spiral out of control. And I think for them, that is a way to make sure, okay, we let's not do anything that would make things worse because, you know, uh, a much more challenged and much more difficult and fractious us china relationship would have direct impact on the Chinese economy in terms of you could prompt the U.S. to take far more drastic trade measures, uh, punitive measures to that would damage the Chinese economy. So, and you might turn off the business community, foreign investment community, which is already that the, level, the confidence in that, that, that segment is already fairly uh, battered. Um, basically, I think they wanted to make sure the external environment is as stable as possible. You might not get it to where you want it to be, but let's make sure that it doesn't get any worse. And I think that's sort of been informing how they 
adjust their the way they engage with the Americans, engage with the Europeans, with his closer neighbors in Southeast Asia. That the domestic uh, considerations actually play a significant role in in changing their approach. Uh, but in the long term, I don't think there's going to be a chance of a significant change because um, a lot of people, I think, in China do buy to this idea that China is on the up. Uh, Xi Jinping describes this as Doushan uh, Xinjiang, which is, you know, the East is rising, the West is declining. Uh, although there is a caveat when he talks about this, which is uh, the West is still fairly strong in certain areas. But fundamentally, the trajectory is clear in their minds that it's going this one way. And if we stay the course, if we knuckle down and do the right things and do the difficult things, we will get there because the stage is set for us to succeed. Um, so if that, from that perspective, I think a lot of people do buy into this idea, buy into this notion that the historical trends are on China's side. And with, if, with this sort of mental mindset, it's very difficult for them, very difficult to see them adjusting uh, because you know what they're doing is commensurate with what, it, in their minds, what a great power should be behaving, which is to sort of flex its uh, authority, uh, do things that would make others pay deference to them, command the respect of the international community. So these things are commensurate with what they uh, should be like if they are this power destined for global preeminence. Um, so if that, as long as that belief is remains, and I don't see any reason why it wouldn't, uh, it's hard to see them fundamentally readjusting this form of more assertive foreign policy. In your book, you, you touch on the potential of China as a future superpower. Um, so what stands in their way? You know, what are the what are the challenges that that you see? I think there's two main challenges, and one of us really talked about before. Uh, I think that well, fundamentally, I think you you can look at it in terms of domestic governance challenges and foreign policy challenges. Um, in terms of what what might get in the way of them achieving their broad macro goals. Uh, domestically, I think we talked about the centralization of power in the Xi Jinping right. So. Uh, in the book, I actually document some of the pitfalls from, you know, this very uh, high degree of centralization that she has enforced. Because um, in terms of policymaking and implementation, there are costs. There are uh, sort of backlash and difficulties that are sort of created when you centralize power to this degree uh, in the Chinese system. And I think one example... I have pointed to when asked about this is um, how China basically tried to unwind its zero COVID policies. Um, you know, in the Chinese system, career advancement is very much tied up with your your practical your the ability to deliver pra on your practical goals you know, and the, the sort of directions set from the top, whether you actually enact them or not, whether you achieve these uh, KPIs that are set for you that has direct bearing your advancement. And one of the KPIs that emerged very clearly during COVID was uh, no outbreaks. You, if you are a local official, you must make sure there are no major outbreaks in your district, in your area, your county, your city, wh wherever they may be. Uh, and if there is a sort of significant uncontrolled outbreak, you can kiss your job goodbye. Um, and we saw quite a few officials who were accused of negligence and dereliction of duty when outbreaks sort of emerged in their areas, people were punished. And that became like a very clear driver of their behavior. Okay, to avoid getting sacked, to avoid any damage to my career prospects, I will do everything in my power to make sure there are no outbreaks. And that translated to very tough underground measures, very strict uh, zero COVID controls, people getting locked up in their compounds, not allowed to leave, the daily lives disrupted to a very severe extent. And that caused a lot of unhappiness, which we eventually saw erupt in the so-called white paper revolution in late uh, 2022. Um, but when the time came, everyone in, this, and everyone in China understood that there, there has to be an end to this eventually. There must be a transition away. Um, and there was language, there was language from the center emanating, like we need to prepare for, you know, uh, exiting this uh, zero COVID strategy, uh, which meant you need to do things like prepare hospitals, prepare stock on medication, uh, ramp up vaccination uh, levels, especially for vulnerable people like the elderly. But everyone knew what needed to be done, but no one was doing it. Because I think, first of all, local officials have very limited resources. They have limited manpower, limited money, uh, limited, basically, a headspace to deal with all these issues. So 
what do they defer to? They defer to the thing that they know would make sure they won't get sacked, which is to maintain zero COVID. But very few of them did anything to prepare for the exit, even though everyone knew it had to be done. And I think this stemmed from a high level of centralization and fear within the system imposed on the top. People are worried about consequences of uh, negligence, dereliction of duty, disobedience, uh, co contravening central party policies. And in that mind, the safest thing to do is to keep doing zero COVID because they know the direct consequences of that and avoid doing the other necessary thing, even though the center was starting to make noises about needing to switch to that. Um, and that's where we saw, I think, this very centralized, fear-driven uh, governance system basically stumble on itself. It, it failed to make the necessary shift that everyone knew needed to be done because at, at every level down from the center, people sort of saw the safest thing to do from a very narrow perspective, from their personal career perspective, is to stay the course, to avoid doing things that get fired. So this is, this is an Achilles heel in this type of system. Right. Uh, you could say so. I think it is. It is a, it definitely a flaw. It is definitely a, a, a sort of nature of the authoritarian top-down system, where yes, they can be very decisive in doing certain things. They're very quick because of the nature of uh, how things are uh, structured and how it operates. You know, the Chinese system. They like to call it mobilization uh, approach to governance, where the center issues a call and the people lower down to respond to that call and. When you know the system functions properly, things can move very quickly. But there are also problems where a system like that, when you go to find the extreme, uh, it cannot. It gets very um, bureaucratic. Things get you know various pathologies within the system. They sort of take control, and I think we saw that happen with the att attempt to move away from zero COVID. That sort of it was very rigid for a long time, and then. Finally, when it became clear to everybody, okay, this actually is what we want to do now, and it suddenly dismantled very quickly. So when they want to move, they can be very decisive, but getting there can be very difficult. So let's uh, let's talk a few minutes about Taiwan. And when I saw you in Singapore, we talked a little bit about you know 2027, which is you know that's made the rounds and the the Davidson window, so-called Davidson window about time to invade Taiwan. But I thought you said something really interesting and insightful about Xi's personal calculus or maybe a way he might be thinking about this. Can you share that? Sure. So, um, first of all, I think this 2027 timeline, we need to clarify what it means. Um, basically, the 2027, the date, the, the significance of this date is that it's the head of anniversary of the PLA, um, which I, the Chinese have said like they want to deliver certain outcomes. They want to deliver. They want to show that they've modernized the military to a certain extent. It is eventually. It is part of this greater goal by the by the, the middle of the twenty first century. They want to become a great socialist power, which entails you know advancements in economic, social, military front, and so that, that, that it is part of a longer set of longer uh, longer term goals. But 2027 being a key anniversary year, I think that basically the rhetoric is built around this idea that we need to deliver a, a modern, take significant steps towards modernizing the PLA. Um, and as you saw in recent events, the recent purchase of two former defense ministers and other senior members of the PLA, you could argue that perhaps they are not as close to this goal as they'd like to be, given that corruption, despite more than a decade of uh, anti graft campaigns, still remains a serious problem within the military. Um, but yeah, I think that that's that's actually what that date means. So there has not been any public association with 2027 with the idea that Taiwan must be taken back. Um, not to say that it won't happen; nothing is impossible. But I think is we have to be clear about what that why the Chinese talk about that date and what it means to them. Uh, the other sort of this talk of associated with Taiwan, I think, primarily came from outside observers who extrapolated. You know, rightly or wrongly, that there is a implicit uh, Taiwan timeline in it. Uh, in terms of Xi Jinping's view on Taiwan, I think yes, he does talk about Taiwan in, in a much more assertive way than some of his predecessors. Um, we, did, we know from talking to people who've been in rooms with him, and like he, when he talks about Taiwan, he doesn't need the script. You know, he's very he, he's ready to talk about this issue. From from the gut, so to speak, you know, he he knows the issues quite closely. He went, he was in Fujian, he was there, basically the the closest province of Taiwan. He dealt with a lot of Taiwanese people, business people who were investing in China at the time. So it is an issue that he's familiar with. 
Um, he doesn't need notes, talking points to discuss it. Um, but why did that translate to this willingness to take decisive action? I think that there's, there's a lot of steps along the way that you need to take before you actually get there, right? Um, in terms of uh, decision to actually mount a fast food takeover, I think that is something that they, in, in, in their words, actually, when they, they publicly when they discuss that one, they say they don't prefer it. This, this, they don't rule it out, but they do say their preference is for peaceful unification. Um, for a very good reason, because if you decide to take Taiwan, you're not just talking about the military challenge, which is supremely difficult, um, which I'm sure you understand, you know, given the, 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 practical, the practicalities of mounting what would be the largest ever amphibious invasion in human history, uh, but also the difficulties in pacifying uh, territory as big as Taiwan. The party has gone through a very difficult period trying to pacify Xinjiang, pacify Tibet, and even now, you could argue there is an attempt to sort of, quote unquote, pacify Hong Kong uh, through the, the gamut of national security laws and national education. So it is a major challenge to try to pacify Taiwan if and at some point you do manage to take over the island. So all these challenges will be, you know, factors that any leader has to consider. Uh, but also, given going back to the, the scale of the military challenge, there, there's a huge risk of this not succeeding. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned to you during our meeting that uh, I, I would like to use an example where, of this Chinese TV drama uh, about the Kangxi Emperor. And there was a scene that I was very shocked by, which is, you know, the Kangxi Emperor wanted to mount a leader expedition himself to the country's northwest, you know, to pacify the rebels there. And uh, one of his ministers counseled him, it's like, um, you know, you should not lead the expedition yourself unless you have a 100% chance of success you absolutely assured a success because if you fail, uh, you could bring down the entire edifice. Your personal authority will be challenged. The, the entire legitimacy of system might be questioned um, and it could all fall apart from that. So I think from in Xi Jinping's part of it, he has to consider factors like this. He has to consider, is it, is it a good idea to potentially bet the house uh, and potentially lose everything on a project that is highly fraught, very risky, has a long tail in terms of things you need to do after, even after you succeed, and potentially at the cost of your great achievements on the mainland. You know, he definitely wants to build a legacy. We know he cares about history and his place in history. You know, having done all these things with 1.4 billion people, is he prepared to willingly put himself in a position where all that could be jeopardized by trying to reclaim a territory with 23 million people on it? So never say never. Uh, but I think the idea that he would be so ready, chomping at the bit to do it, I think is questionable. Yeah. Uh, there may be different circumstances where he, he feels that he's forced into doing it, but that's, I think, a different discussion. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of if it's purely a decision of his making, I think at the, at the current point in time, it's very hard to see him making this choice. So you, you've studied clearly Xi Jinping. And so let me just two more questions. One is, how do you think Xi Jinping, um, what's he doing with Russia? What's that, that uh, you know, we love each other forever kind of approach to things? What's behind that? Well, just, I think, beca just because yeah. the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing? That seems to be the case. And I think that actually explains quite a bit of the relationship. Um, there is obviously... Uh, no love lost between the two of them. Um, within well within living memory, they fought a Sean Border skirmish in 1969. Um, there is a long-standing distrust between um, Russia and China, and I think that's sort of in some ways inevitable for any two countries that share such extensive border uh, and has uh, overlapping interests. Um, but in terms of the current state of affairs, the current geopolitical landscape, I think China has, in some ways, you could say they have, don't really have a choice uh, if they want to find someone who's willing to stand in their corner in what they perceive to be the big um, geopolitical struggle uh, that defines their future, which is China's ability to compete with the United States. Um, if, if they recognize that to be the core goal, which is to... Um, engage in a vigorous competition and in their minds hopefully overcome the United States and uh, surpass it in terms of global preeminence, then they need as many uh, substantive partners in this project as possible. And I think 
from from that perch in Beijing, if you look out to the rest of the world, there isn't really anyone else apart from Russia. Uh, with well, the sort there's, of there's North Korea and Iran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this and North Korea to them is like this. Uh, they 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 are bound by them through a range of factors, including the idea that they will not want to have American allies right on their doorstep. So I think that's, you know, the, the other factors, as I'm sure you're well aware, like, you know, they, why they could never abandon relationship with North Korea. Iran also, I mean, yes, uh, it is one of those powers, that middle powers that on, on balance you want to have on your side, but in terms of the ability to shape global affairs, the ability to shape outcomes, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the United States, there is no other power at that level. I mean, the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, you know, it's, in, if you want to break it down very simplistically, it's 3 2 right? China needs to make sure that its partnership with Russia uh, stays the course, that, that they continue to maintain this uh, key support from, you know, in, from that perspective, a lesser power. Uh, China, in terms of economic and military front, it would see themselves in being in a better position than Russia right now, especially uh, seeing the Ukraine war is evolved to where it is at this stage. Um, Russia is in in some ways fairly in, in, a, in a weakened position vis-a-vis -vis China, and I think China is milking whatever can get out of that dynamic. Um, but I don't see, basically, fundamentally, I don't see this picture changing. This partnership will remain as long as it's useful to China, and given what we know of the geopolitical landscape for the foreseeable future, it's very hard to see this dynamic change in. And as long as it remains, Russia will, be, will continue to be an important part. So that's all very sobering. So let me, this, we can finish on one, one question. And that's, and I want, from Xi Jinping's perspective, is there a way to coexist with the West? Or is this an economic, technological Cold War, and there's going to be a winner and a loser? How does how do you believe Xi Jinping sees this? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be zero sum. I don't think, from his point of view, that like victory doesn't mean you, you, you know, uh, eliminate the Western threat to China or it's like this achieving this crushing victory of some kind, um, however you define it. But I think uh, fundamentally, China needs to be in a position from uh, Beijing's perspective where it's. You know, it's it's preeminent position is not questioned. I think they want they do they do see a future for themselves where they sort of are brought back to this uh, leading position on the global stage, where their opinions are sought, where their interests are looked after, uh, or at least not infringed upon. And right now, I think they're in a stage where they think as long as the United States is the world's number one power sees itself as the world's number one power. This sort of balance, a, a sort of equilibrium where China is in a strong, potentially uh, number one position, it cannot ha simply cannot happen because the other side would try to, you know, change that change that uh, dynamic. So as long as that's the case, I think China would constantly have to sort of push against or. You know, struggle against in, in their more martial rhetoric against against the West in trying to defend what they have and push for more. Um, I don't think necessarily it means like they, they they have to defeat the West in that sense. Um, but I think they they do want to achieve a certain equilibrium where they get to more or less call the shots. They in the sense that they they don't have to listen to the West when deciding things of global import. Uh, the West would have to take their opinion very seriously, ideally even defer to them on some issues. Um, but I don't think it means like China gets to decide everything. Because in some ways, I think Chinese are not that interested in running global affairs or becoming this global policeman the way that America has been doing. The Chinese have so far, we've seen no interest in providing security um, guarantees you know they're not getting security or militarily involved in the biggest conflicts around the world today um israel palestine they've said the right the, all these uh, they provided rhetorical support for palestine uh, they criticized israel but fundamentally they're not putting troops on the ground they're not trying to offer any security guarantees to uh, ensure certain outcomes emerge um, and i think this instinct would remain in place for a long time so as long as this remains the case 
I think uh, China will be a very different sort of global power that the United States has been in terms of its willingness to use and project power. Chen Han, thank you so much. What a really enlightening uh, discussion. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Andy. That was Chun Han Wong. I'm Andy McCretis. Please join us next week for another episode of Intelligence Matters. And you can always reach us at intelligencematterspod at gmail.com. Intelligence Matters is produced by Steve Dorsey with assistance from Ashley Berry and Sophia Rubin. Intelligence Matters is a production of Beacon Global Strategies.